the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel. Like the video you are about to watch. This is a concept that has been, um, it's not foreign to the body of Christ, but maybe the understanding and the application. A disciple, I wrote down here, you may want to write, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another. That's a disciple, broadly speaking. That a disciple is one who, number one, accepts and then number two, assists in spreading the doctrine of another. So the condition to be a disciple is number one, you must accept the doctrine you are about to spread. So from the standpoint of that conviction, you will assist in making it known. A disciple. Discipleship is the spiritual system that mentors and matures believers. Matthew chapter 28, please give us from verse 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus himself, when he rose from the dead, Matthew 28 from verse 18 to 20. Go ye therefore. Okay, and Jesus, okay, any, any, just start from 18. Let's take it from 18. Jesus came and spake unto them saying, all authority, the word there is exousia, all authority in heaven and in the earth is given unto me. 19, it says, go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost 20 it says teaching them to observe teaching them create a don't just preach to them don't just get them saved create a system of mentorship disciple nations colossians chapter 1 and verse 28 Colossians 1, 28 and 29. Paul was mentoring the church in Colossae. And he says, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present. That's the goal of discipleship. That's the goal of doctrine. That we may present every man to be perfect in Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. It says the same, not a different one. The thing you have heard, the way you were trained, it says commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is the scripture that birthed our school of ministry. That the things you have heard of me among many faithful witnesses, commit it to faithful men and they will be able to teach others also. I wrote something down here. The course content for the believer's education is called doctrine. There is a course content. There is an allocated body of spiritual knowledge. Now, this does not mean visionary experiences, encounters are bad. No. It is that they are only support systems, not foundations. Write this down. We may differ in many things, but there are foundational doctrines that the Bible calls pillars or foundations of the Christian faith. That means that the idea is not to make all of us the same in personality, the same in modes of teaching and operation. No, that's not the idea. The idea is that we come to a point where the foundational pillars 
that represent the fabric of the Christian faith is preserved regardless of the change in mode regardless of uh, the mentorship systems if we deviate in the foundations it's no longer Christianity Hebrews chapter 6 Hebrews chapter 6 doctrine verse 1 therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ it says let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation and he mentions six dimensions number one repentance from dead works number two faith towards God verse 2 number 3 the doctrine of baptisms number 4 of laying on of hands number 5 of the resurrection of the dead and number 6 of eternal judgment we're not going into all of this but this is just to let you know that Paul was telling them that no matter how you vacillate there are foundations that must remain unshaken. This is, this is really where we're getting to, we're getting to the, the zenith of my communication now. The truth is that we may not always teach the same uh, modes of operation, our personality differences, the biases that have come from our personal encounters, the products of our alignment and all of these things differ. But in all of our communication, we must make sure that all believers globally are mentored after the same foundation so that no matter what happens these people are standing on the same foundation permit me now to borrow something that I want to read for us I had the privilege to be in the seminary and there was something called the Apostles Creed Please listen carefully. We were made from day one. You had to learn it and to know it of heart. Now it's not only the Anglican, Catholic and so on and so forth. Are we together? Now I want to read it for you. Um, no bias at all for any denomination. I'm just communicating it because in later years I would discover the power and the richness of what we were chanting without revelation. This for me is a representation of what we believe any believer who does not believe this no matter what else you believe you are not a Christian you don't know a Christian just because you accept prosperity or reject prosperity no those are matters that the implication does not necessarily attack the the, the fabric if I will use that word but there are things if you do not believe if they are not captured in your teaching and your mentorship system it is not the Christ of the Bible that is being communicated can I read it please here's what it says the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth number two I believe in Jesus Christ. These are the foundations of the Christian faith, Pastor Dele. We have to go back to vet because there are all kinds of arguments right now. And it's costly to assume that just because I am a Christian, we are talking about the same thing. We may be able to, we may argue about all of the prejudices that come around the body of Christ. I know that we're a body that is still evolving. But in the midst of all our imperfection and the issues, we must go back to vet. Do we really believe the same foundation? I believe in God the Father. If you do not believe in the existence of God the Father, it says, Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The one, one Lord does not mean singular, it means unity. Our God is one Lord. Let me continue. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. But now we know that he's not the only son. Today he's the first begotten of we the brethren. These are foundations of the Christian faith. Our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary that he suffered under Pontius Pilate he was crucified oh that is important don't jump that he didn't just die if Jesus just died without crucifixion he could not become a cause because the law is that it is in your dying on the cross that you are being a cause it says Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law being made a cause for us for it is written it's a law cause is every man that hangs on a tree not dies hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham what is the blessing of Abraham not cast and money the blessing of Abraham is justification by faith might come upon us the Gentiles comma to the end that we now justified might receive the promise of the spirit to faith every version puts full stop after that statement so the whole system was to transport the Holy Spirit into us He died and was buried. He descended into hell. That is true. Hades, the place of the dead. Scripture tells us that he went to hell. And when he went to hell, something happened there. Is that true? Apostle Peter even told us that when he triumphed, he also preached to those who were... Is that true? That they were bound, the prisoners in hell. He preached the gospel. They were the first to hear it. And then he came out with them. He did not resurrect alone. The Bible tells us that graves were open and the ancient saints, they came. This is the Bible. The Bible says, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. The resurrection is a concept that brought trouble between the um, Pharisees and the Sadducees. So it's not enough to believe that Jesus came, that he died. Do you believe he resurrected? He is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He says from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. That is true. I believe in the Holy Spirit. It writes here the Holy Catholic Church. There is a star that is written here. Because the Catholic, respectfully speaking, is not just talking about the Roman Catholic denomination. The word Catholic means the universal body of Christ. So you can safely say, I believe in the body of Christ. That there is such a concept as the body. I believe in the communion of saints. Otherwise, our gathering, it says, unto him shall the gathering be. Is that true? Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It says to not forget and neglect the gathering of the saints. That means whatever comes to indefinitely attack the gathering of the saints is attacking a foundational truth, a pillar. There is no amount of social media that sustains the power to replace what happens because there are many things that happen when believers gather. One of it is that there the Lord had commanded the blessing. Hallelujah. I believe in the communion of the saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Ah, otherwise, that, that is the basis. The forgiveness of sins. Otherwise, what is your gospel? What do you tell the sinner? I believe in the resurrection of the body. That one day, the Bible clearly tells us that with a loud trumpet, isn't it amazing to know that if our hope is only in this life scripture tells us clearly because there are all kinds of doctrines now that are coming up as to the reality of the resurrection or what the bible calls rapture now there are certain concepts that were not used exactly as they are pronounced one is trinity the second is rapture however from biblical exegesis there is a way you can compare scripture with scripture that proves the reality of this the trinity and God said, let us. Is that true? The Holy Ghost comes on Jesus, the Word, and the Father speaks from heaven. Trinity. They are about to kill Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost. He looks into heaven, sees the Father sitting, Jesus standing at his right hand. Trinity. So we believe in the existence of Trinity. Not based on a visionary encounter, based on the integrity of the Word of God, which is profitable for doctrine. 
this is how we make our defense then rapture there's no word in the bible rapture but there are events the bible tells us that it says that the day of the lord will come like a thief in the night i think i've corrected that scripture should we look at it first thessalonians 4 is that first thessalonians 4 verse 1 please give it to us is it first thessalonians or second give us five let's see we have to touch on it yeah first thessalonians 5 verse 1 but of the times and seasons brethren you have no need that i write to you now he, this is talking about the events that believers call rapture a quick correction I, I should use the opportunity to just correct something that has been a trend in the body of christ and yet is not accurate from scripture for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the lord so cometh as a thief in the night it's been a teaching for many years in the body of Christ that Jesus is coming as a thief in the night to believers. From the authority of scripture, I tell you that is not a very accurate teaching because those who communicated it as well-meaning as they did, they did not read the scripture accurately. Next verse. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction coming upon them as travail upon a woman and they shall not escape if you are a christian read verse 4 one to read one more time wow <laughs> this is the bible he is coming as a thief in the night not to us the bible says the coming of christ will be in the similitude of the days of noah have you read that in the day of noah did the rain take noah on unawares no noah was informed about it is that true when all the animals came god himself closed the door and then the rain came and the bible says it will be that day most times when we talk about the days of noah we just talk about it with respect to the nephilims and all the reimagines of the giants and the extraterrestrials that is a dimension but that's not the only dimension It is true that in the similitude of the days of Noah, all these beings, these disembodied spirits will find expression again. And they already are here. There's nothing to hide. We know that already. If it is true that we are one with him, inseparable by the spirit of grace, why should it take us unawares? Then it means our oneness deserves to be questioned. There is an exact formula for the coming of Christ. The Bible says all of what we call the signs of the end times, the Bible says they are only the beginning of birth pains. Is that true? There is only one condition that is given biblically. It says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, not as a message, as a witness. That means God has no right to judge and condemn anyone who did not have the chance to listen to that message so the message you don't have to receive it but there has to be a witness that it reached you that means we can determine when he comes by the seriousness of our global evangelism are you getting what i'm saying now the bible says looking forward to and hastening the day of his coming so if you are tired of the mess around the world the key is not to say jesus come uh -uh. just because you are born again you are not the only one he loves he loves the world remember the bible says that imagine if the person who preached to you that you got born again now said jesus come before you were born again let me tell you this the essence of the revival and the move of god is to confirm the fact that there are many reasons why we know Jesus is coming back. Number one, because the Bible says so. Number two, because Jesus went to heaven with his body. The condition to be on this earth is that you must have a body. 
the first time he could not come because there was nobody look at the activity a virgin was needed a responsible husband who could manage her in spite of the fact that she was not his child are we together the courage to resist all the accusation of the scribes look all that went through for jesus to come so he didn't take any chance he went back with his body he doesn't need a virgin to come back again he can return on earth with his body the man jesus is seated on the throne so as far as the law of territory is concerned he can come there are things we have to believe the reality of God the reality of Jesus Christ almost all religions capture in their framework something about Yeshua it is not everything about Jesus that saves there is an information about him that saves Jesus as a Jew does not save Jesus as a human does not save there is a message there is something about Jesus that saves number one you must believe his virgin birth number two you must believe that Jesus is God incarnate perfectly human and perfectly God you must believe in his sinlessness that looks easy until you talk to a philosopher these are the pillars of the Christian faith it is for many religions it is almost inconceivable how the holy spirit will play the fatherly role of jesus in fact the whole idea of the trinity is a confusing concept that only by the wisdom of the spirit would you be able to scratch into it if there is a trinity why are there two thrones in heaven why not three because the third throne is us you see it's true pastor i am concerned and my concern is that if there is no restoration the foundational truths of the kingdom today respectfully speaking if you want to teach it many people will say you have exhausted all your revelation you don't have anything new again to share the appetite for new things and rema has put pressure on men of God there are so many men of God in this country in Africa who are under pressure literally they sleep and wake up on YouTube searching for anything that is new Wow Anakazo that becomes the message for Sunday now it's not happening because we are evil people no it is the pressure show us how current you are in the things of the spirit by telling us that there are seven planes i just came back from a dimension in the spirit no one has gone to you know how vast the realm of the spirit is many should i talk about this now i shouldn't even hmm. do you know paradise is not heaven Jesus said, this day, you will be with me. The man on the, that thief, you remember the thief on the cross? This day, you will be with me in paradise. Many people have gone there and they call it heaven. I hope you know there are different planes of heaven. The earth is a minute fraction of the vastness of the realm of the spirit. Just because you were out of your body and it was not evil spirits you saw, does not mean you were in heaven. I'm, I'm trying to how how do I this is a we're matured believers do you know there are other spiritual civilizations the Bible says while men slept it's in your Bible it says the enemy came so the enemy is living among men the Bible never called that enemy a man he said while men human beings were sleeping there is another species of people that came and planted this tear and left 
they have seeds too and they can plant are we together when you read like i was saying yesterday i'm only saying it because a reference was made to it enoch the seventh man from creation right he talked about encounters where some of these fallen angels desired the daughters of men you think these angels just came to beautiful women and say i want to marry you i want to have children no the women will not agree like that that's not how you ask your wife out you didn't just come and say i must marry you by force no that was slave trade and all of that but a decent matured there is always a system of seduction those fallen angels proposed ideas they were the ones who taught people how to conjure witchcraft by passing through fire this is this is bible history they brought some of these things that empowered people supernaturally right and when these giants these nephilim races nephilim and they are not the only class of giants they are just the prominent ones we know like nimrod kush og the king of bashan goliath of god and all of these people but they were not the only ones there are people on earth today who are carrying human frames but they are not humans it's true they are not pure humans satan also has his seed salvation is only for men who came from adam i hope you know if you did not come from adam you cannot be part of salvation that's why demons cannot hear the gospel and repent the 24 elders the rendition that kjv put there is that um you know when they say the worship of the lamb they said and had redeemed us unto god no the rendition is they had redeemed them unto god you see that now those elders had been there for a very long time they didn't just arrive there and those elders are not just the departed saints of old no people had visions in the old testament they still saw those people they saw the creatures they saw the elders i told you that we are immersed in a dispensation we don't know how many dispensations before we arrived and how many more are waiting for us the word eternity means the summation of infinite dispensations we are only one out of many dispensations past and dispensations to come that's what makes god ancient of days if he's only six thousand years we can't call him ancient of days because a thousand years is like a day so he, he that would just be six days it's not enough to be ancient from the realm of the spirit when god is called ancient of days it is a very deep statement because it means that a lot happened i hope you know once upon a time lucifer was not even created and god was still god and there was a program so what was that program lucifer was not yet created there was a day God taught about him because our whole scope is like he starts from Lucifer and ends with his destruction. No. When people like Nathaniel Bassi says you are God from the beginning to the end, it's a very deep statement. Do you know why I'm teaching you this? I'm not boring you. You see, when you stand to minister the power and the grace of God, these are the information that stand as the support structure that release power according to scripture when jesus was transfigured he showed us how his spirit man was pure light and that is the standard we keep pressing into man shall not live by bread alone every time we feast on the word the revelation there is a dimension of illumination that we have are we are we together that illumination is noted even in the realm of the spirit they can see the increase and the growth we will stand in the golden city in the new jerusalem all our hope and all our pain will be no more we will sit at his table and cry holy is the lamb we will worship and adore you forevermore please look up the days that are coming will test all that we know that we call christianity 
I assure you, the Bible already told us that our works will be tested. Everything that we know. Do our children believe in God? Do our children believe in Jesus? Do they believe in the Holy Spirit? Do they believe that man is unable to save himself? That salvation is an act of God's grace and mercy. Apart from our works of the law, it is the gift of God received through faith. There are many people today in the church who believe they are saved simply because they have been around. But the Bible tells us it is a foundational doctrine. We have to be careful because honestly speaking, many people are going to hell. They are not just being around God is not the condition for heaven. No. The Bible says there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we must be saved. In fact, it puts it this way. The formula, the, the, the formula is in Romans chapter 10 from verse 8 to 10. It says that who shall ascend on high? How did he put it now? And then it says that the word is nigh thee. Romans chapter 8, please. But what said it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Watch this. And in your heart. So as far as salvation, the new birth experience is concerned, according to God's intelligence, your mouth and your heart must participate. Are we together? The word of faith which we preach, verse 9. It says, if thou shalt confess with your mouth, not with your mind, you can think with your mind, you can speak with your mind, but as far as salvation is concerned, you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you shall believe. Listen, if you believe in the cross and you don't believe in Jesus, you are not saved. It's not the cross that saved men. It's Jesus that saved men. Believing in the cross is wonderful, but the cross in isolation to Jesus is not salvation. You shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. For verse 10 says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. That is another concept. Maybe another time if God grants us grace, we'll be able to do definition of terminologies. Sin, righteousness, judgment, salvation. What does it mean to be born again? It's a very interesting concept because in reality there is a difference between being born again and being saved hmm. when we call people to surrender their lives to Jesus like we say we give our lives to Jesus the Bible does not teach that for salvation you receive his life that's salvation when you give your life to him is the surrender that leads to service offer yourselves as a living sacrifice is that true romans chapter 12 holy and acceptable unto god he does not call it your altar call he calls it your reasonable act of worship these are the concepts that we must balance in the body of christ so that when we send missionaries out when we send people out we are sure of the quality of the harvest and then we are sure that when the people are saved they can be grounded they can be mentored Otherwise, my dear people, I tell you sincerely, a time will come when many people will begin to depart from the faith. And a time will come when global evangelism will die because it, it looks like we don't see the use again. Most people participate in evangelism simply because they are doing it in loyalty to churches and ministries that they are part of. Or they are doing it in loyalty to men and women of God that they love and respect. But intrinsically, the revelation that truly sponsors the global harvest is not yet there. Hallelujah. Righteousness. What is the nature of God? What is Zoe? This life that God gave man. We call it everlasting life. I don't know if it was here that I made that correction like pastor Dele rightly shared it is true that when the bible was being canonized and translated the english people did their best in the translation and because 
um, the Bible, the Old Testament was largely written in Hebrew and then the New Testament was a combination of Greek and Aramaic. And the context of communication, Hebrew is like Yoruba. One word can mean many things. One word, N, can be at, for, with, by, same word. So those who translated this, the institutes, they did their best to capture the, the richest essence of that word. And many of them were not filled with the Holy Ghost. Remember the, 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 this Holy Spirit issue we are talking about. We have to really talk about that issue. There is no hope if all we bring to the table is just intelligence. And so we find a lot of mistakes that continue to confuse believers again and again. The word zoe is not just eternal life. You may have heard me say it. Everybody has eternal life. The condition for eternal life is not accepting Jesus. The condition for eternal life is passing through the womb of a woman. When you preach to people, you don't ask them, will you spend eternal life? The question is location. Lazarus and the rich man, sin one, when earth was over, they were still alive. Is that true? The rich man was still alive. He could remember. His memory was still working. He said, I have relatives. Please. He was thirsty. He could feel the impulses of emotion. Just water from the drop of your hand. It was not a parable. He was really thirsty. And Jesus said, no. That already is a message we can preach. Jesus said, mm -mm, you don't need to come back from the dead again. There are two principles that will work here. There are the prophets and there is the law. That anybody who does not pay attention to the principles already on earth, even if something comes in the beyond, it will still not convince them. That should help us to begin to probe carefully many divine revelation encounters where they see almost every man of God who has served Jesus Christ in hell. Some of those things are, and the vessels may be sincere, but because they themselves were not mentored in doctrine. I've told you that doctrine has, doctrine gives you the coordinates for administering the gifts of the spirit. So that no matter what you see, you see them through the lens of doctrine before you interpret them. Are we together? So for instance, if we're rounding up now, I forgot that this is a Monday, a morning service, you can imagine. <laughs> I always think it's a vigil, goodness. Imagine that the Lord opens my eyes now, prophetically, and let's say I see a spirit behind this, my dear sister. Now, my interpretation, wrong or correct, will no longer be God's fault. It's dependent on my accuracy of the word and my establishment in doctrine. Are you seeing why random impartation? Jesus refused to do impartation. He said, I know you people. Sit down and learn. Impartation will happen after three years plus 40 days. He did not impart on them to go and preach. He gave them his name. Like I give you my ATM. It's not your own. You use it and give me back. So you can trust the fact that I have money. The, it, it was not anointing they used to do. No, 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 no. He gave them his name. When they returned with it, they could not do that miracle again. Read your Bible. Is there anyone who left Jesus independently and said, I now have the name. And went outside of his command. No. I can see this spirit and now if I am sound in doctrine I should understand the character of God and the way he operates that every revelation as far as it comes from God is for edification are we together so I'm not going to put fear in this lady now if assuming God forbid her my dear assuming that I see that I just have a vision of a ghastly motor accident I won't come to this woman and say Madam, you are there though. Tuesday. Mark, Mark Tuesday. I don't know, but may God help you. I will pray for you, but with what I'm seeing, you're already gone. Now, it may be true. Watch this now. Because visionary experiences work like time zones. Some people enter morning before others. So you can peep how the morning looks like if you tap into a particular time zone. That's how visionary experiences work. 
some people enter tomorrow before others and yet we are still in the same earth geography has helped us to know how visions can work there are people who are eight hours behind so while other people are almost getting to afternoon that's when some people are entering that's the advantage of visions it can help you right but it must be administered within the boundary of doctrine the soundness of scripture honestly there is no hope for our spiritual experiences if we do not submit them through the sieve of doctrine the margin of error will be so high it will not glorify jesus christ even though the gift came from him now if i am if i have been properly mentored and i am sound in doctrine I will see my vision through the lens of the wisdom of the word as I speak to this woman. There are certain information I will not even give you because number one, I will be able to discern your spiritual level and know that giving you this information now, you may not be strong enough to receive it. So there are certain experiences I will just withdraw it and intercede for you. If I sense that it will be profitable to tell you, then I will be able to tell you in a way and manner that does not downplay the victory of Jesus Christ. I cannot downplay the victory of Jesus Christ over something. No, what I've seen, what then is the excellency of dominion? What then is the excellency of the finished work of Christ? What then is the excellency of the name, the blood, the word? Even if there is a legal basis upon which the devil is destroying you, a scripture should already give me stability, blotting out every handwriting and every ordinance that spoke against us. So I speak from that standpoint. I'm able to administer the gift and the grace of God with accuracy because it is bounded by a sound a, it's like there is a jurisdiction of doctrine so don't let anyone please pastors those ministers listening around the world don't let people intimidate you with gifts they should still sit down and learn doctrine because I think that's one of the things that people do around the church people come and because of their prophetic inclination they automatically exempt themselves from the mentorship of doctrine and they will cause confusion in that church even though they are sincere people because the devil sees the loophole in their spiritual understanding colossians chapter 1 and verse 9 the three realms of knowledge to know to be filled with the knowledge of his will to be filled with all wisdom and in spiritual understanding we ordain people today just because he prayed for someone or because he prophesied and we now say you are a pastor you see and that person is there and the devil is so happy he's there because there is a vast uh, there is an array of loopholes that the devil can choose anyone as he pleases so you find out that sincere people become instruments of disaster let me respectfully say this as i round up this morning we must not compromise on the conditions that qualify people to stand upon this altar and communicate the truth of god's word if a celebrity gets born again he's a babe there is no instant maturity in the kingdom we must sustain the courage to allow people pass through are we together now yeah if someone has been in error for a long time and he repents he's a babe let us hallow our altars once again and bring people who truly have been trained even though we remain students in the school of the spirit but respectfully speaking we must trust god to to stand with a level of maturity that can sustain and lift up the name of the lord the level of childishness and immaturity upon our altars from sentiments to tribalism to every kind of a plethora of things that doctrine was designed to cover we don't have to fight the messages whether they are right or wrong the messages are a resultant effect of something leave the messages leave the error don't worry about them focus on the vessels let's restore ourselves back to doctrine and in this school of doctrine there's no graduation we continue in them so whilst we are done after preaching from a powerful program like this we don't exempt ourselves and say have you gotten the teaching we go back ourselves once again let me refresh and you are reading genesis like you just got born again and you are reading the finished work of christ again 
and then the devil now comes to tempt you and say by now you should be pressing into deeper things and the spirit of god tells you settle down continue in it i want to believe that part of the things that jesus was teaching in those 40 days there were repetitions of certain things I will not be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things, although ye know them and are established in this present truth. Please rise up on your feet. We have to wrap up. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From the pages of my heart, let my worship begin that never ends. You're my God and your name is Yahweh Your name is Yahweh Yahweh You're my King and your name is Yahweh Your name is Yahweh Hallelujah We just have two prayer points this morning the first prayer point is not for ourselves the first prayer point is a deep intercession coming from a heart of love for the body of Christ we are going to pray one prayer for the body father restore your body to doctrine restore your body to doctrine more than opinions more than cunningly devised fables even from well-meaning people Pray for ministers of the gospel. Grant us the grace to not be ashamed of the exegesis of doctrine. Let our appetite for new things, revelation, not, not cause us to mislead believers. Help us to be intentional, to return back to the patterns of spiritual growth. According to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. The fundamentals of the kingdom that make for a solid foundation so that will become immovable unbendable steadfast are you praying for the body of Christ all of you who are following please join in this prayer pray for your pastor don't condemn them don't call them names don't go around insulting people pray for them grant us the grace oh God to be restored to doctrine That will not compromise on the foundations the pillars that represent our Christian faith hallelujah praise the name of the Lord the second prayer point now is for ourselves it says study to show yourself listen I defined a disciple for you that a disciple is one who accepts the doctrine then promotes the doctrine a disciple is not a goer you are made by the doctrine then out of the strength of your conviction you become an advocate of it many of us may need to unashamedly return back to the doctrines of the kingdom we may need to buy some of these old books we have ignored to go back again to your bookstore some of you after this service you may need to rush to a bookstore and so I know they are faded I know the quality of the print was not there but contained in them are rich truth some of you may need to go back to study the Gospels again afresh Matthew Mark Luke and John you may need to study the book of Acts again Ephesians the Pauline epistles add to your depth strengthen your foundation because when all is said and done if your foundation still stands then you really stand are you ready to pray for yourself we're going to pray for ourselves and also by extension we'll pray for uh, those who are following us from whatever nation the grace to be established in doctrine please lift your voice and pray the grace to be established in doctrine the grace to be established in doctrine the grace to be established in doctrine the grace to be established in doctrine
then shall we say to these things? For those of us who are privileged to be here in the studio, and it's indeed a privilege. You know, this is a closed meeting. It's now open to everybody. And those who are following online, what do we make out of all this? Because we are going to be judged by what we are hearing. And I think if you look at the core content of this curriculum, God is repositioning the body. And that's why I'm not excited when things like this come forth. It calls for sober reflection. And I want us to go on with attitude to know that God is giving the body of Christ another opportunity to reset. Some of the things we have called ministry, that we have called church, they are not really what it's all about. And I think God wants to do a thorough work in our generation, and that's why it's given us an opportunity to come, you know, you see that even when he was writing the letters to the seven churches, he was still very strong about the issue of doctrine. In Revelations 2, 14 and 15, he talked about those who hold the doctrine of Bela. And of course, the doctrine of the Lycolaitans, which I hate. So imagine the Lord, even his exalted state, still was writing to the churches and saying that, look, you can't preach some things. I mean, imagine what it described as the doctrine of Balaam. In the Old Testament, Balaam was a person. <laughs> By the time the Lord was exalted, it became a system of, you know, a framework, a doctrine. And he said that he put a stumbling block before the people and so on and so forth. And now said, there's even one that I hate. Just praying for those who open our eyes in the church in Nigeria to know what he hates, what is that going to be? We will give again this morning to support the ministry of Apostle Joshua Selma. And let me say something about the giving this morning. Apostle, by the grace of God, and believe me, he has not asked us to do this. He's not that kind of person. They're starting a walk in Abuja by the grace of God. I want us to give to us what they are doing in the city of Abuja. And uh, so Koinonia, they're going to begin to meet in Abuja. And it's happening this month. And I just felt led by the Spirit to do that. And, and we're go just going to do that. And it will come up one more time again. And like we've been doing, to answer just one question. And I know what the question is. <laughs> just one question. Praise God forevermore. Can we be seated, please? Can they put, can I have a worship team? There's a song in my spirit, and they put an account on the screen. And don't forget, we are people of integrity. Everything received this morning is for Apostle Joshua Selma. And for those who are watching, I think they can project the account on the screen. Give generously. You know, this time we are giving to a walk. And if you believe in the call of God upon the life of this man, and it's been a blessing to you, please, I want you to give generously. He has not asked us to do this. Let me just have those who, um, who have my, you know this song, it's just coming to my spirit. Though we are few, we're surrounded by many, who has passed this way before, and this is the song we've been singing forever. You know, these new Christians, <laughs> they don't know the old songs. <laughs> All right. Do we know it? Please, can they project the account on the screen? We're waiting for that so that we can start giving why we Hallelujah. 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 We're still waiting for... Okay, now, please. Let's, let's uh, gain a bit of understanding. This is not a regular offering, please. I, I, I want you to pray to God and everyone watching do that and ask... What does he want you to do? And do it. That's as simple as that. That's how we do our things there. So nobody's under pressure. But we want to support what God has put in the heart of Apostle Selma to do in the city of Abuja. With this kind of 
um, outlook. Now he's been operating from Zaria. Now the Lord is asking him to start a walk in Abuja now. And that is very, very prophetic. That's the capital city of our land. So you can imagine this kind of conference now, meetings like this now happening weekly in the capital of our country. So that means there's going to be raised a new breed of Christians. We're about to experience what happened in church at Antioch. Antioch started raising a different breed of Christians, different from what was obtainable in Jerusalem. And before you could say Jack Robinson, the epicenter of the move of the spirit shifted from Jerusalem to Antioch. That even prophets had to come to Jerusalem to come and, you know, Agabus and the rest of them to come and, you know, do something in Antioch. And when Barnabas got there, the Bible says he saw the grace of God. And we all encourage them that the purpose of that is to continue with the Lord and so on and so forth. And by the time Paul stepped on that platform too, what Apostle Paul could not achieve with the Jerusalem brethren unlocked his ministry at Antioch. Because the Bible says they were there teaching the word for one year. I mean, Apostle Paul got his teaching grace when he identified with the brethren in Antioch. In Jerusalem, they didn't even believe he was born again. So, when you see God doing something like this, it's for the body. And if you look at the unique grace upon life and ministry of Apostle Selma, it's for the body. He's not doing anything for himself. It's for the body. It's for the body. So, that's why it's always an opportunity to give and to sow into what God is doing. And just like Pastor Godman said yesterday, the Lord was given out an opportunity to be part of what he's doing. And that is why what we're doing this morning is of immense covenant significance. All right, let's take the song. Then we'll take a question and we'll close the morning session. Hallowed be your name, our Father. Forgive us, we are few. We're surrounded by many who are Swear before, and this is their song. We'll be singing forever. Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Say, Holy is the Lord. Holy is the Lord. Few. Come on, and though we are few, we're surrounded by many who have run the and this is the song we'll be singing forever. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And did you notice? Maybe in another conference, and Apostle, you know, you've been talking about this VG. I think we need to have it. So you will give us a date <laughs> which you can just come from about 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. I was with a group of students at Redemption Camp. Timmy was with me. Where's Pastor Timmy? We we're there together. My first session with them was 10 hours. I started teaching and nonstop, as in I taught for 10 hours, nonstop. The second day, I did 13 hours, nonstop. So within 48 hours, we taught for 23 hours. That, that's, that's doctrine. You see, I, I, I had to tell them, in fact, to get all of them ready, I said, we are fasting. So the idea of I want to go and eat is not there. You begin to wonder what Paul was doing 
that he taught, Etiquot fell, raised him and continued to preach again until the breaking of day. That is the lost art of Christianity in our generation. This 45 minute service is not going to get anybody anywhere. And that you are complaining because a service is more than two hours. Who told you a service has to be two hours? After Ananias died, the service continued. It was hours later, Sapphira came. Service was still on. And Peter said, you know, did. <laughs> and he said, young men. So young men were in the service. But young men of today, uh, it's more than two hours. The same you, you walk from eight to five. And you don't, you don't say walk <laughs> should be two hours. You log in the eight hours. And that's why it's called walk. But this is also the work of the ministry. It's work also. Just two Saturdays ago, we were in Lekki. Another four hours. With the leadership of our Lekki church. Because that's how you, you do the systematic delivery of apostolic doctrine. Did you notice... That every time doctrine is mentioned and is of God, is of the apostle, and is true, is always singular doctrine. But once it's of men and of Satan, it's doctrines. <laughs> Diverse doctrines. Doctrines of men. Doctrines of devils. They continue steadfastly in the apostle's doctrine. Single. If any man wants to know his will. He will learn the doctrine. Single. So in this question and answer, no, you may be sitting there. Thank you very much. What, what I want Apostle to just briefly address so that we can um, wrap it up this morning session. And the evening session will start at 5.30 so that there can be enough time, please. We'll now, because we also want our guest ministers to rest and uh, so, by the grace of God, we will we'll try to get Apostle to start teaching for six so that we can also have, because it's the last session. I know uh, that last session is we have to get everything. So, um, and that is an information for everyone. So, by 5.30, please, like we said, join us online. It's an online meeting. And uh, privilege, uh, those who are privileged to be in the studio with us, we, we thank God. And uh, please, just stay online and we will... So, Apostle, okay, new minister is just starting out. You know, we've been looking at startup. And he's interested in this doctrine thing. And he wants to get it right doctrinally. Where does it start from? How does he, you know, what is the approach? Is there a systematic approach to that? So that I, I want to start out in ministry and I want to be sure that everything has got to do with doctrine. I get it right and, you know, I'm not gambling and I just want to be sure. And of course, if somebody also has deviated from the pathway and is now beginning to learn doctrine, what is the process of coming back, you know? Especially when you now need to tell your people all along you have been wrong. Uh, should you just do it that way or systematically, you begin to bring the people up to speed with what God is doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two questions in one. Number one is how to approach the issue of doctrine. Um, ideally, according to scripture, the foundation for correct doctrine should start from the mentorship platform. That means that naturally, it is assumed that the man of God or whatever spiritual platform that provides the leadership should be sound in doctrine so that out of their accuracy, they can now lead, but we know that that may not be the case. I will advise that person, number one, the first, the first assignment is to trust God for grace to identify a man of God or maybe a group of men of God who, um, who represent a level of soundness and balance. Transformation is difficult without a reference. So you will have to pay that price by the Spirit. Take out time to pray and God will help you. Because usually, if, for instance, 
you identify Pastor Dele as a man who you have seen a sound exegesis of doctrine within the boundary of balance, you will now find out whether he has a school of ministry or a Bible school or a discipleship program. You see that now. There's no excuse because at, at the worst, you can get his teachings. You can buy the tapes, find out. There are people who have done, I know, Pastor, you did, a, I think, the whole of Acts, if I'm not mistaken. Now, so you can see, if it means to pay for some of these materials, you can pay for them and sit down. If there is an organized platform that communicates this, then that's an advantage. Um, if you are already under a ministry and you're not comfortable with the approach of that ministry, especially in light of your enlightenment, number one, do not fight that ministry. Understand that every man who is truly called of God is doing his best. We differ in our levels of alignment, but we must be able to, um, to vet the sincerity of the heart and accord every man of God honor. Because this is, uh, I, I hope I'm not taking time, sir. I think I need to say this because one of the things people do with revelation is that they use it now and begin to fight pastors, fight people, make it look like you don't know anything. I just came from a conference where something serious was talked about. What is this nonsense you are giving us again? And they become troublemakers. I think it's a wrong spirit. The goal of revelation is not to puff us up to fight people. However, uh, and then also, do not fight that structure by introducing principles that are not consistent with their modus operandi. I would advise that person, let your growth and your transformation first be personal. Because I'm saying that because there are people listening, you understand what I'm saying. There are denominations where it's not going to be easy to just use zeal without knowledge to introduce some of these things. You will violate their patterns and you'll be surprised God will not support you. You see, so I would advise that regardless your denomination and the limitations or otherwise, you can use your newfound light for your personal growth and edification. Start from there first. Then as God grants you an opportunity, if you can have any formal system of mentorship and training, either directly under a man of God who represents for you, there's nobody who knows it all. We're all students in the school of the spirit. So the idea of perfection is out of the way. It's just to be able to find a man or a group of people who are worthy references enough to get you going. If you can subscribe to a Bible school or you can buy books, maybe what we may do is maybe in the evening, I have a few books on revival. We'll add one or two on this. I know for one, um, the basics of the Christian faith, E.W. Kenyon, he has done a basic Bible course and an advanced Bible course, two kinds of righteousness, the name of Jesus. Kenneth E. Hagin also has done justice on that. And um, I think... Many of the word of faith people, if I'll use that word respectfully speaking, they have done well as far as establishing the pillars of the Christian faith. So we can start from there um, and it will be a great balance. But in all you're doing, do not fight anyone. Then if you are the man of God yourself and you find out that you may not have been communicating the best and now there is a need, um, you don't have to come out and embarrass yourself. You, are not, you, you didn't do something wrong. You are just growing. It's like a baby saying, I'm sorry for being a child. No, you grow. The most important thing is that you must sustain the humility to evolve. Because it takes a lot of humility to evolve. It will mean that you would have to silence some of the wrong communications that have come from ignorance. Sometimes you would need the courage to also sever certain relationships if your being in their presence will have to make you sustain certain truths that you now know will be antagonistic to your conviction. So you don't live in guilt. You are part of a group of people, but you know you no longer believe um, what they are teaching, but you still have to keep that loyalty and all of that. It's, it's not going to profit you. But you don't have to come and stand before members and say, I have been wrong. There's a psychology to leadership. Um, when you express weakness in the presence of your people, even when you are sincere, it affects their trust. So it's wiser to evolve as growth than to communicate it as weakness. I, I don't know if I attempted the question. Thank you. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the vision to yourself. 
share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel, comment on it, like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.